Good evening, I'm Pete Peterson, Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, and it's a delight to welcome you here to tonight's evening conversation with Tim Carney and Ann Snyder on Tim's new book, Alienated America. It probably would not be um, nice to rub in the fact that I have a return ticket tomorrow to Malibu, California. <laughs> But as I understand it, actually, tomorrow is supposed to be 60 degrees and sunny, which all goes to show that even your weather is polarized here <laughs> in Washington. Uh, polarization is something we care a lot about at the Graduate Policy School of Pepperdine. Uh, as I've noted on a few other occasions, as a school founded by the late great political scientist James Q. Wilson, we definitely care about the moral sense and if there's a time in American politics in which we really should be asking more incisive questions about things that really can't be easily measured, it's this time in our politics and policy. About two years ago, uh, we launched something at the Graduate Policy School called the American Project on the Future of Conservatism. This was an initiative started as a way of exploring uh, the future of conservative thought and its impact on American public policy. Though we are a, bi a nonpartisan institution, these are a set of issues that, again, as a school founded by James Q. Wilson and taught by Jack Kemp and Michael Novak and Victor Davis Hanson and others, we have a, a strong affinity to that side of uh, thought. And it might not surprise many of you to know that in much of academia, this exploration, even a friendly exploration of conservative thought is something you don't usually see. When we began the effort in 2017, one of the first things that we did was convene a group of academics and activists on our Malibu campus in June to uh, begin a conversation about what is the future of conservatism, what defines it, and how will it impact public policy. And I have to say, it was the hardest thing that I've ever done professionally. Um, as someone who, uh, is a facilitator of uh, meetings. Uh, I tried to do my best not to lead towards a particular outcome. And with the co-director of the American Project, Rick Taffel, who is here tonight, uh, we designed a series of conversations over a long weekend that was going to explore a series of issues uh, and uh, the role that conservatives and conservatism might play. What began as a series of arguments over the future of the American presidency, thankfully did not end there. And by the end of the long weekend, we resolved in a place I could never have imagined. Uh, across this group of 35 academics and activists, people from across the right side of the, the conservative spectrum, there was a general consensus that really our problems were not political, they were actually cultural, and specifically that our issues were really a challenge, uh, were being challenged by a pervasive alienation and loneliness. Um, that was something that frankly cut across political categories, but it was understood among this group and then following in the, in the months that followed that unless we were addressing these issues of alienation and disconnection, ones that our political climate are actually making worse um, we weren't really going to resolve the toughest challenges uh, facing America. That led to a principles document called A Way Forward, which anyone that's interested can find it up on our AmericanProject.org website, and a series of following conversations to look at how can a more communitarian conservatism be reimagined for the 21st century, and what role does it play in public policy? One of the speakers at our June 2018 convening on our Malibu campus is Tim Carney. And I learned from Tim that he was working on this book. And as someone who has read an advanced copy of it, I couldn't be more excited about what you've done, Tim. And I really do hope that this book has the impact that it deserves. Because the arguments that you're making are at once um, classical, but extremely contemporary. And at the same time, I think that one of the great failings of our politics in the last now seven years is that when Charles Murray came out with Coming Apart, a lot of people said how smart that book was, but nobody did a darn thing about it. 
And so I think what you've done, it's easy to dismiss a prophet. It's not easy to dismiss a reporter. And what was prophesied in 2012 with Murray has now been reported and looked back on and in many ways looking forward. And so, again, I'm, I'm so excited to be uh, co-hosting through our American Project this conversation. And so without any further ado, please join my friend, uh, Cherie Harder, to introduce tonight's speakers. Well, thank you, Pete, for that introduction. I'll just add my own welcome to all of you to tonight's evening conversation on Alienated America. As Pete noted, this is part of an ongoing partnership between the Trinity Forum and the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, where we have tackled such light topics as reforming public theology, the role of friendship in the political imagination, the strange persistence of guilt in a post-religion world, full of religious world, as well as tonight tackling loneliness and alienation. Uh, we're really grateful for the partnership with Pepperdine and with, with you, Pete. It has been a delight and a joy. Uh, we're also delighted that each of you hardy, stalwart souls have joined us tonight for braving snow and sleet and dark of night to be here. Uh, the federal government may have shut down, but we're very glad that you showed up. So it's a smaller crowd than usual, uh, but we think this will be a fascinating discussion and just so are so glad that you're a part of it. I also just wanted to recognize a few special guests. Uh, in addition to Pete joining us, I believe Brian Swartz from Pepperdine is here. We're also delighted that so many of the advisory council members of the American Project, which Pete described, have joined us this evening. Uh, we're also glad that we have some friends of the Democracy Fund who have joined us tonight. A trustee of the Trinity Forum who flew in from Houston, George Clark and his wife Ashley Clark, so glad that you're here. Uh, as well as several past speakers who have joined us uh, for tonight's conversation, including David Brooks, Ryan Streeter, and senior fellows Joe Laconte and Jamie Smith. So glad you all are here. We know there are many people who wanted to be here, but we're not. Perhaps we're not quite as hearty as you. So if you have friends uh, who were hoping to be here this weekend but missed out, we are live streaming tonight, both on our YouTube channel and on Facebook. So let them know so they can follow along. We'll also have video up on our website within 24 to 48 hours, as well as photos on our Facebook page. So while it is very rare that the Trinity Forum will ever encourage greater use of the social media, we do encourage you to log on, tag your friends, and would welcome your comments. To our friends in the media who are attending tonight or online, we're really delighted to have you as well and simply ask that you source the Trinity Forum with the content that you quote tonight. For those of you who are not familiar with the Trinity Forum, we work to provide a space and resources for the discussion of life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And we do this both by providing readings and publications which draw upon the enduring themes of classic literature and letters as w and connect the timeless wisdom of the humanities with timely issues of the day, as well as programs such as the one tonight in connecting leading thinkers with thinking leaders and engaging those big questions of life and ultimately coming to better know the author of the answers. As we've noted in previous evening conversations, it has often been said that the big questions of life boil down to essentially three. What is a good person? What is the good life? And what is the just society? All three such big questions are on the table tonight as our speakers grapple with the origins, meaning, and consequences of the growing alienation among Americans, its implication for character formation, what makes a good person, personal and societal well-being, what makes for the good life, as well as its long-term effects on sustaining a just and free society. They'll examine the strange and sinister paradox in which we find ourselves, that although we live in the richest country in the history of the world, with unprecedented comforts, conveniences, and technological advancements, a growing number of Americans believe the American dream is dead. Even as we grow ever more virtually connected, we report more isolation and estrangement from each other and from the institutions which nurture social ties. Even with new medical advances, we've seen a decline in life expectancy, 
a surge of suicides, more than a doubling of overdoses, a growing wave of deaths, of deaths of despair. In the words of one of our speakers this evening, Americans are increasingly alienated from their society, their neighbors, their communities, from other humans. Lacking the environment of a strong community, more Americans lack the scaffolding to climb above their starting point. They are strangers in their own land. He concluded, America is a wasteland of alienation. Life in such a wasteland may be devoid of the friendships, family ties, and work opportunities that make for flourishing, but this wasteland is fertile ground for political anger and extremism, which, in another sad irony, only further divides and isolates. So what then can we do to reconnect the alienated, restores the ties that bind and build people, neighborhoods and communities, and reinvigorate the character-forming and life-shaping relationships and institutions that both ground and grow us. In his new and excellent book, Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse, our keynote speaker tonight argues that the fundamental crisis facing the body politic today, the erosion of local civil society, may be nationalist in scope, but is certainly localized in both origin and manifestation, and that therefore the most potent responses will also be local, relational, and institutional, as opposed to a broad sweeping national political solution. Further, he argues, given the evidence that the most pervasive and powerful localized engines of civil society are the churches, synagogues, and mosques of America, the reinvigoration of local civil society, he argues, necessarily depends on the revitalization of the houses of worship in the US. It is a provocative, fascinating, and countercultural argument, and one that our keynote speaker tonight makes with no small amount of energy, insight, and relished reporting enthusiasm. Tim Carney is the author of the newly released book, Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse, as well as the commentary editor of the Washington Examiner and a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. A prolific author and columnist, he's written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and many other publications as well. His earlier books include The Big Ripoff and Obamanomics. An alumnus of St. John's College, as well as a New York native, Tim now lives in the D.C. area with his wife, Katie, and six children, proving that in addition to his other talents, he is both a master of uh, time management and, uh, and multitasking. <laughs> Responding to, uh, to Tim will be Ann Snyder. Ann is a writer and a convener focused on questions of uh, class, culture, beauty, and a beatitudinal faith. She currently directs the Philanthropy Roundtable's Character Initiative, a pilot program that seeks to help foundations and business leaders strengthen the middle ring of morally formative institutions, those which mediate between the state and the individual. Another widely published writer, she is a fellow at the Center for uh, Opportunity Urbanism, a Houston-based think tank that explores how, uh, how cities can drive opportunity for all of their citizens. Her latest and imminently forthcoming book, The Fabric of Our Character, A Wise Giver's Guide to Supporting Social and Moral Renewal, will be released in less than a month on March 15, 2019, which we commend to your attention. She is also, I am very proud to say, our newest senior fellow of the Trinity Forum. After Tim provides opening remarks and Anne responds, the three of us will have a very brief moderated conversation followed by questions from the audience. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Cherie. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, you mentioned we, uh, we have a bunch of kids, but having a book come out is a lot like having a baby come out, but then you have to bring the baby up onto stage in front of a bunch of people and defend it. So it can be a, a, a little nerve wracking, but I, I wrote the book because I have a story about the American dream and specifically about this idea that it's dead. And so it's a story about faith, it's a story about family, it's a story about community, 
But it's also a story about how Donald Trump became the president of the United States. I'm a political reporter, so the story begins in Iowa. And because I'm an Irish Catholic, the story begins in a bar. <laughs> a sports pub called Joe's Place in Iowa City a few weeks before the Iowa caucuses. I met a, met a couple. She worked at the uh, university there. And she told me she'd grown up in Iowa. And this was 2016 was maybe my third or fourth caucus that I'd caucuses that I'd covered. And so I said, where? And she said, Orange City, which was a place I'd never been. Now, again, I'm an Irish Catholic. I'm a little obsessed with ethnicity. So when I hear the color orange, I can get a little triggered. I was wondering, is this, is this some county full of Ulstermen up there in, north, in northwest Iowa? She so said the orange referred to the Dutch heritage and that about half of the people there had Dutch ancestry. So I said, just, just how Dutch is it? She said, I used to wear wooden clogs marching past Windmill Park they, they would push brooms down the street as part of something called the Tulip Festival Parade. So this was like a Simpsons episode send-up of a Midwestern town that, that's Dutch. And her name was Holly Vander something. I don't exactly remember it. But so I went, off, I went off to Sioux County, Iowa, where Orange City is, to see what made the, these people tick. And I was greeted by a sign that was literally in the shape of a clog. And I went out from Orange City, I went out to Sioux Center, the county seat. I attended a Jeb Bush rally there. Two things I noticed, yes, they really were Dutch. All the old ladies were named Wilhelmina, which is the name of the Queen of the Netherlands from World War I, World War II. Two, I noticed a strong antipathy towards Donald Trump. This is ahead of the caucuses. So there's a lot of Rubio supporters, Jeb supporters, some Cruz supporters. One questioner wouldn't even say his name, said a candidate with the initial DT, I went up, I found a, a local pastor, and he said that of the 900 people in his congregation, he knew one who was supporting Trump in the caucuses. And sure enough, uh, the Republican caucus is there. Orange City, Trump bombed. Sioux Center, Trump bombed. Sioux County was literally his worst county. He got 11%. And his other worst counties included two other predominantly Dutch counties. Uh, Lyon County next door and Marion where, uh, where Pella, Iowa is located. So we, we political reporters, you're always talking about the Hispanic vote or maybe the soccer mom vote, the black vote, the Cuban vote. I was beginning to think maybe there's a Dutch vote. So come March, I look out at Western Michigan where Holland, Michigan is, and sure enough, the five counties Ted Cruz won were the five, county west, uh, the five Dutch counties in Western Michigan. Something was going on. I wanted to know what it was. Were they upset that Trump was appropriating the color orange? <laughs> <clears throat> so intrigued and baffled, I, I went out there. Um, I, the people I'd spoken to, I, I, I tried to figure out what, what it is. What's going on? What's doing this correlation? Back at Dort College in, in Sioux County, one guy had said he's a uh, husband of a professor out there. And he was a political liberal, but he loved, he loved living there. He said, well, out here, people, they vote right, but they live left. And I'd started to get really intrigued. What does that mean? Are these people like, are they swingers? What's, what's going on? <laughs> no, he, he, his exact quote was, that's just what you do. You care about your neighbors. You care about your environment. And you take care of it yourself. So I got kind of annoyed that he thought that that was living left. But I, I set aside my peek, and I realized what he was describing. There was immense social trust in Sioux County, in Sioux Center, and in, uh, and in Orange City. There was a New Yorker profile in 2017 that ran of it. They channeled the arguments of the townspeople there, saying, there are plenty of jobs here. This is of Orange City, Iowa. It'll take you five minutes to drive to work. When you have children, we'll help you take care of them. People here share your values. It's a good Christian place, and they care about you. If anything happens, they have your back. So I was starting to see, as a political reporter, what was going on. In the places where the American dream was clearly alive and well, the man who said the American dream is dead wasn't having appeal. These were conservative Republican places that would eventually vote for Trump over Hillary Clinton. But early on, while he was getting so much traction in most of the Republican primaries and caucuses, he wasn't in some of these places. So leading up to the Wisconsin primary, I visited Oostburg. It's a, a village of about 2,000 people, about 50% Dutch. Got there on a Sunday morning. I sat at Judy's place. And uh, 
what I saw there made very obvious what was going on with these Dutch populations and what should have been so obvious beforehand. The families came pouring in from the 9 a.m. services at First Reformed Church and the 9 a.m. at Bethel Orthodox Presbyterian. And as a Catholic, I noticed that these things lasted much longer than an hour. I was kind of shocked that they were in church for that long. 9.15 at First Presbyterian Church in Oostburg, uh, the families came pouring in. And then the 9.30 services at the First Christian Reformed Church, not the same as the First Reformed Church, all came pouring into Judy's Diner, all in this village of 2,000. Throughout the day, I learned many of them would go back that night. Three of those four churches had 6 p.m. services that the whole family would go to. The thing that made these Dutch communities in, in Michigan, Iowa, Wisconsin so strong was the church and the institutions that spun out of them. These Christian Reformed churches, um, and I'm using a lowercase Christian Reformed church, not just talking about the CRC, these Dutch Reformed churches built schools, built institutions, built charities, built nonprofits, mostly built strong community that tied people together, that, that made a situation where there was a scaffolding around which to raise families. They had planted in the plains of the United States these incredibly thick institutions of civil society that made the good life more accessible. And it wasn't just the Dutch, of course. Politically, you look at uh, Trump's second worst state was Utah. The Mormons were doing it as well. And I saw closer to home, um, not necessarily my, my parish of St. Andrews in, in Silver Spring, which is an excellent parish. I'll, I'll probably talk about it a lot tonight. But um, there's uh, two streets in my neighborhood. One's Kemp Mill Road, one's Arcola. They intersect. There's a Kemp Mill synagogue and an Arcola synagogue. These are both modern Orthodox synagogues. They both have basically one precinct, one election precinct that's made up mostly of the people who live there because of the prohibition on driving on the Sabbath. They have to live within walking distance. And so these, these precincts, these were overwhelmingly uh, Ted Cruz in the Republican primaries. I don't think it was a, a, a love for Ted Cruz so much as it was there were two choices. The man who said the American dream was dead and this other guy who was um, offering, whatever he was offering, it wasn't as dour of a message. Funny thing about living in this neighborhood and having six kids is when my wife shows up at the grocery store with the six kids, uh, she often gets somebody warning her, I'm sorry, uh, ma'am, that, that beef there is not the kosher beef. And she, <laughs> she has to tell them, it's fine, we're not gonna eat it on Friday, so it won't violate any of our rules. <laughs> but so the same day that Cruz carried the Orthodox precincts of Silver Spring, I'd spent the morning a bit down the road in, in Montgomery County at Ch the village of Chevy Chase. So this is the wealthiest municipality. This is not sort of the lesser Chevy Chases, such as where Brett Kavanaugh lived, which I think was Chevy Chase Section 5, or DC Chevy Chase. This is the village, the wealthiest municipality in the wealthiest region, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And uh, like the village of Oostburg, the population is 2,000. Uh, the average home price is 10 times the average home price in the village of Oostburg, 1.5 million. The, um, Trump, who got 54% statewide in Maryland and who won Montgomery County, believe it or not, he got only 16% in Chevy Chase. The elites were rejecting Trump. And in addition, go back to Michigan. In addition to losing Western Michigan, he also lost Gross Point in Ann Arbor. Just as he couldn't get to 20% in Sioux and Marion County, he couldn't get to 20% in Iowa's Johnson and Story County, which are two of the most educated counties in all of America. South of Oostburg, Trump's worst counties in Wisconsin were uh, Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington, highly educated, wealthy. So here I need to address something. Uh, this audience, a lot of this audience already knows this is, is false, but it's a, a false belief I call the Lena Dunham fallacy. It's the belief that a lot of conservatives hold that when they see things like f dropping numbers of marriage and rising out of wedlock births, they assume that this is all a bunch of alumna of Wesleyan going out and with their Catherine McKinnon books in hand, rejecting marriage and all of that. Um, no, the elites, and there's dozens of good liberal and conservative authors who say this, the elites are practicing what we Christian conservatives are preaching. And so when you look, I mean, 95% of Chevy Chase's families had two parents at home. The village hall hosts like father-daughter dances constantly. There, there's their family places. 
50% of babies born to working class women are born out of wedlock, but only 10% of those born to college educated women. There's uh, tons of data on this. Uh, college educated men are more likely to get married and half as likely to get divorced. But so we've got two different political phenomena here, right? The elites voting for Kasich in the Republican primary and then voting for Hillary. The Oosbergs, the Orange Cities, voting for Cruz or Rubio in the Republican primary and then voting for Trump in the general. But these two phenomena, I argue, the, the Chevy Chase and the Oosberg, these two villages are one. And they're one village because these places are places where the American dream is alive because they have many overlapping institutions of civil society. There are communities planted thick with these institutions that give you a sense of purpose, that provide a safety net, that connect people to one another. As a wise woman once said, it takes a village to raise a child. And both of these villages, Oostburg and Chevy Chase, they both qualify. And where these institutions are, the American dream is alive. But in much of the country, we don't have these institutions. So the affliction of the working class then is this. It's not purely economic. It's not that there are a bunch of deplorables who won't get with the, the times. It's that they live in places. We always have to think of people in their place. They live in places that lack these robust institutions of civil society. And so, I mean, what does community do? This is something I didn't spend a lot of time thinking of, and I read until I had a, a moment where, um, it's in the, in the introduction of my book, our one-year-old daughter, I was running, sprinting down the street in Georgia Avenue in, in Silver Spring, trying to get her to an urgent care center. Uh, my wife and I had done, if any of you are, are Catholics, you know this, and, and have kids, you know this strategy. We call it divide and conquer, right? Where you've got, you don't want to bring all the kids to, to mass. So one of you goes to 8.30 mass, and one of you goes to 11.30. It's not optimal. You can't do that at the Christian Reformed Church where there's only a 9.30, but you can do that as a Catholic. But this, this time we had a good excuse that Eve was really sick. But so my wife and the oldest daughter are off at the 11.30, and she has a minivan that has a baby car seat, and so I'm, I, you can't just buckle the baby into the back. So with a jogging stroller, I'm sprinting to the urgent care center trying to call her, but you, you don't answer the phone during mass, and so I'm not getting through to her. And so I'm sprinting down. Finally, she sees a text from me and sees what's going on and comes and meets me, and we end up in the hospital. And um, at some point when I'm describing to the nurses why we have so much chocolate and food, and against the hospital rules, beer being delivered to us. I said, well, that was a family from our pool. That was a family from our parish. That was a family from our boys' school. That was somebody from the examiner. That was somebody from AEI. That was somebody from a, a conservative libertarian nonprofit on which I used to serve on the board. All these friends, who I just thought of as a swarm of friends, Every time I tried to explain them to somebody else, there was an institution, there was a mediating institution that had formed and strengthened this bond. And so that safety net is a huge part of what community does. Another big part of what community does is providing a sense of purpose, is people need you. Somebody, they need somebody to coach kindergarten girls basketball. This is literally something I did. It's totally absurd that kindergarten girls basketball <laughs> exists, but it does, and I coached it. And in the end, somehow, somehow I, I loved it. Um, but there, there's other stuff. So that's a, the safety net, the sense of purpose, the modeling. Um, then there's a lot of interesting economic data. Raj Chetty, a researcher in association with Stanford and Harvard, found that when it came to upward mobility, intact families and strong social capital by various measures were the two things that most predict, on the local level, were the two things that most predicted upward mobility. So institutions of civil society, they catch you when they fall, they give you a sense of purpose, they provide good modeling, and they help you climb the ladder. They're little platoons, and they are the beating heart of the American dream. So again, what's going on in the places where the dream is dead? <clears throat> so as a reporter, one of my colleagues in, used a term for part of the way I do my job that I hadn't necessarily come up with and I didn't necessarily love it when he put it out in public, but he said, Tim Carney's very good at bar reporting. Bar reporting is when you go to a bar and you talk to the people and, and you, <laughs> you f I found out after a while, there's certain bars you don't go to. You don't go to college bars because they're mostly from out of state and they don't vote. If you go to a hotel bar, again, they're mostly out of towners. 
Sadly, I found uh, I went to bars that had high immigrant populations. I had a little bit of Spanish, but again, they're not talking about politics, very low involvement in national politics. But I also, f so I, I settled on yuppie Irish pubs, basically, because there were liberals, there were conservatives, there were men, there were women, there was old, there was young. But what I had stopped going to had been sort of the country roadside bars. When Trump came around, you had to go back to those bars. And, um, and so that's where, uh, where I went to in, in some of these places in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. I settled on that because I found some graduate student had done a study on drop-off in religious uh, affiliation. And Fayette had the, if I wanted to combine drop-off in uh, Catholicism and drop-off in evangelical Protestantism, Fayette County had, had the biggest drop-off. Um, I found out after I went there that it was also in the top two on unemployment, on disability, on all sorts of negative measures. And thanks to Yelp, which I didn't have when I was doing bar reporting in 2004, I found there was a roadside bar called Smitty's that was renowned for excellent wings. Um, but Smitty's fit the, the, fit the bill of a Trump bar because you have to drive there, uh, which was, again, not something I was used to coming from uh, living in the D.C. area, coming from uh, Westchester County. You, you walk to your local pub. Driving would not be a prudent thing to do, but you drive there. Um, Fayette County's overdose death rate is 57 per 100,000. That's 50% higher than the state average, twice the national average. So this is, this is not a, a, an uplifting place. But I went into Smitty's, and I'm talking to people there. And sure enough, they're all voting for Trump. Um, they, they cited guns as a number one issue, but you ask them about the economy, and pretty soon the, the conversation turns to uh, welfare programs and abuse of it. And in anecdotes that are always second or third hand and a little bit racially tinged, you get stories about the welfare mom who's using food stamps to buy T-bone steaks for her dog or the person on disability who's using that money to buy drugs and deal it. And so uh, being a reporter, another, in addition to bar reporting, one of my tactics um, of reporting I call being kind of a jerk. That is... <laughs> prodding people in ways that no polite person would do. This is what we do as journalists, right? We, we, we talk to people in their worst moments. We, we just ask them questions that are rude. And so this one guy who's explaining to me, Dave, he's you know, explaining to me, well, he can't work because he's on disability. I said, you know, what's your disability? Well, my back. And he gives me a detailed description of all his back surgeries. And he says, so, so I can't stand and I can't sit still for too long. And so I just point out to him, I say, Dave, you've been at this bar on a Tuesday afternoon for a few hours. Now, before you turn this accusation on me, I was working, okay? This was literally my job. But I say, Dave, you've been sitting at this bar for at least two hours. And he says, well, today I'm numb because this morning my son died. And again, Fayette County with 57 deaths per 100,000. The deaths of despair, the overdoses, the suicides, all of these things are much higher among the socially disconnected, and in these socially disconnected places. Suicide rates by state, by county, you see an inverse proportion to population density. The more isolated people are, the more these things happen. Psychiatrist Aaron Cariety explained that the rise in white middle-aged suicides, he said, quote, we're not living in community anymore. Dave was the one who half an hour before I had asked about sort of neighborliness. He said, I don't trust my neighbors. I keep a loaded gun by the side of my bed just in case any of them show up. What the bartender at Smitty said, I think there's drug dealers above me and, and, and quacks below me. Um, so these places, the suffering that some people tried to write off as, as fake, as just deplorables, not wanting to get with the time, the suffering was real. Um, you had these deaths of despair. You have a retreat from marriage. Uh, you have, uh, while out-of-wedlock births are falling across the United States, they're rising among the working class. Um, and so the, one of the most important institutions here is the institution of church. And you have dramatic drop-off in church attendance in working-class America. And the way I look at it is this. And in a second, I'll get to something about solutions, but just a last note on the problems. Um, the secular, America has secularized. And the secularization of America has been bearable for the elites. It's been bearable in Chevy Chase, which, by the way, isn't as secular as you might think. Go to Blessed Sacrament, and the pews are 
a lot more filled there than they are if you go down, that's the Chevy Chase Parish, than if you go down to uh, Southern Maryland. But in general, there's other institutions. There's not just a Chevy Chase Country Club, there's also just stronger public schools. There's alumni associations, there's strong, there's workplaces that function as institutions of civil society. Um, and church-going kids just generally have uh, better outcomes, but in so much of America, the secularization has left them without any institutions. So I wrote Alienated America, and it was, as Sheree mentioned, my third book. The first book, one of the criticisms of it was that there wasn't a solutions chapter at the end. It was like export, import, bank, bad, sugar, subsidies, bad, ethanol, bad, index, bam. Um, <laughs> so my publishers made me write a solutions chapter for my second book, which was also corporate welfare under Obama. And I look back at it, and like half of these solutions are horrible ideas. It's like gold standard, balanced budget amendment, all, all sorts of things that I, I totally do not agree with anymore. So I was kind of, <laughs> kind of wary about writing a solutions chapter. Um, but that's only because I started thinking of what, what's the government policy going to be. But of course, centralization is one of the core driving forces of alienation. And anything that further centralizes power, and if you read your uh, David Brooks column on the Green New Deal, he, he addresses very clearly, he said, the, the centralization of, of power further empowers the elites and strips power away from people at the human level. So the churches become less important, the local communities get less power. So you can't have some end alienation bill, restore civil society bill of, of 2019. Um, and then a lot of the other root causes, technology, we're not going to get rid of Facebook, Twitter, and smartphones. This is a root cause of the alienation and we can't get rid of them. There are policies that can change. I think the real changes are going to happen when state level policies try to empower the sort of institutions that can do it. Anne is gonna be an expert on that and I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna wanna talk to her about that. But, I want to very quickly end. I mentioned the Jewish synagogues, Arcola Road and Kent Mill. The intersection of those is St. Andrew Apostle Parish, where I go. And um, my, my daughter plays on the basketball team. And on the back of her jersey is the name of a guy, Al Weaver. I've never met Al Weaver, but it struck me, because I had just been visiting a campus, I'd just been visiting UPenn, where there's all these buildings that have names of people who donated a billion dollars. And people who donate a billion dollars to create institutions are great. Al Weaver, I researched him, did not have a billion, a million, a thousand dollars to donate. What Al Weaver did was he coached CYO sports at St. Andrew Apostle for decades. And so that, that gave me a, a sort of inspiration. What is the solution? I, there are people in this room who are going to be able to fund an organization or, or through their own professional success are going to be renowned, but that's not everybody. But everybody in this room can be Al Weaver, can be the person who goes out there and starts a t-ball team, who answers yes when asked to coach a kindergarten girls basketball team. But, and think about this, people talk about a good place to raise kids. I think you'd have more families together raising kids if you had more good places to raise kids. So what makes a good place to raise kids? It's not just infrastructure or this. A lot of it is just the mom who starts a potluck every Friday, the, the mom who sort of uh, gratuitously pushes her kid around in a stroller, the dad who says, you know what, we're going to rebuild this playground even though the, the county can't afford it. We're just going to go ahead and do it. You can be the person who can make your neighborhood, a good place to raise kids, and then somebody's gonna get married who wouldn't have otherwise, somebody's gonna have kids who wouldn't have otherwise. So there is no one big solution. There's a million small solutions. Hopefully this room has about 100 of those small solutions. Hopefully in this conversation we can talk about more of it. Thank you very much. Tim. So it's really an honor to be here tonight, and as um, Pete and Cherie said, to see stalwart souls who can somehow go through three inches of snow. Um, 
I've sat in your seats many, many times, and I never anticipated that I would cross this six-foot chasm to stand here. Um, Sheree Harder, I just want to make a brief mention, has long been an exemplar and a friend. And um, I know I speak for many in this room, if you've ever been to an event, and in Washington more broadly, and frankly, in um, Chris, you know, a lot of Christian circles more broadly and outside of Christian circles. Um, I think I speak for many and women in particular when I say that her grace and discernment and articulacy have shaped how a lot of us comport ourselves in the public square. So it's just really an honor to be here. Um, and the Trinity Forum more broadly is a great example of what I like to call a resident alien institution. The sort of institution that the country needs so much more of and that I think both Tim and I, Tim and I in many ways want to encourage to proliferate as one way of addressing the widespread sense of alienation this book paints and he just um, painted. The forum, um, I say this working, helping donors think through what has great impact in the world. Um, the forum doesn't neatly fit inside Washington categories and it doesn't neatly fit inside church or Christian ministry categories, which in my view kind of gives it a holy misfittedness that is nonetheless offering lanes of depth that I think a silent majority of people are aching to swim. Tim, you've written um, like a really informative, insightful book, and I encourage all of you to read it. Um, he self-deprecatingly begins the book's acknowledgments by saying that there's very little that's new in it. And on one hand, that's sort of true. There's been a lot of literature, especially since the election of 2016, but also in the years leading up to the country's great political shock, about America coming apart along lines of class specifically about the crisis of solidarity, of the loss of purpose and meaning, of the decline of the able-bodied male workforce, of growing secularization, of social isolation, of the loss of the American dream for our kids. What Tim does is synthesize a lot of this research in one scenery-filled train ride, catching us all up to the present moment. But it's a lot more than synthesis. What he's done uniquely is report, lending context and voices and names to life trajectories we would otherwise only know as statistics or worse, groups, which in my view is sort of the beginning of a slippery slope toward viewing everything through the lens of tribe. His book is important because it complicates the Trump phenomenon as one simply of race and racism, ideology and belief into the more tangled reality depicting how real people are feeling about their belief in this country, their attachment to institutions within it, their sense of belonging and membership, purpose and place. In this, Tim both existentializes and humanizes what Twitter cheapens into a never-ending outrage contest. He's also uniquely unafraid of religion, as you just heard. In fact, he locates religion and religious institutions specifically as the soul of the matter, figuratively and literally. These two distinctives of his work, thorough reporting on the ground and an unvarnished, evidence-based defense of faith as a non-negotiable part of social renewal give the book both flair and weight. It's a wonderful contribution to perhaps the most important conversation happening in America today, that of whether an ever-renewing society is possible or whether it's inevitable that ours will eventually collapse like every other historic civilization. I learned a lot reading the book, and there are so many different things I could say teasing out the productive lanes of inquiry it stimulated in me. But for the sake of time and coherence, I'm just going to narrow Tim's key contributions to three, and then dribble over to a few areas that I wish he had, the book had covered, and then offer just a brief set of my own discoveries that I hope gets you out of here feeling like you have a new handhold to respond in your own spheres to some of the more discouraging realities the book addresses. So first, what the book does really well. As a reader, you're invited by Tim to accompany him back through the fog of the last couple years to 2016, where it's tempting to assume so much began, but in fact, so much was really just being revealed to a lot of us. Donald Trump being a kind of orange Band-Aid, um, ripping off layers of scabs, just barely covering raw and long festering wounds. Tim's just giving you a sense of the core nature of those wounds, namely the lack of attachment to a meaningful and sturdy web of communities and institutions, so I won't tease that out further. But the thing that I found striking was the clarity with which the book correlates the death of the American dream in certain quarters with the election of Donald Trump. It's 
ugly. And I'm going to quote you a couple sentences here from his book. Quote, you can use Trump's electoral strength in the early Republican primaries as a proxy for pessimism. Death rates, especially death by suicide and overdose, correlated with Trump's best counties. Later, he says, you could have predicted a county swing to Trump by looking at its rate of overdose deaths. And then more broadly, he says, people enmeshed in strong communities rejected Trump in the early primaries while people alienated, abandoned, lacking social ties and community rushed to him immediately. This is a really crucial observation, I think. And if you think like a human being for a second, it actually makes sense. Um, I remember a bunch of years ago, um, a time, there was a time in my life where everything I'd come to rely on as meaning makers and supporters had been uprooted. Family, place, job, faith. It was all awash and tossed into a chaotic tumbler that I neither understood nor liked. I found myself in Houston, a city that I moved to without knowing anybody, seeking a savior to help me navigate. I was looking for something dramatic, and in my case, it was God, to swoop in and make meaning of the shards of my life, provide help, rescue me, direct me. I was over-spiritualizing everything as a potential providential grace or punishment in a raw need to locate a life raft. And so when I read these words of Tim's, I thought, well, I remember that visceral need for a strong man. In my case, it was a fanciful and simplistic notion of God, like in a flowing purple cape. But for those whose last couple decades have been defined by a rude robbing of employment and social scripts, foundational moral norms, and the institutions reinforcing them, Trump was the strong man. He provided a single narrative to, expo to explain their plight, a singular hope gesturing toward familiarity in the past, and a, in my view, a certain machismo that promised to defend this white working class and stick a finger in the eye of all of those condescending to their culture, their way of life, and their moral pride. But what this does yield, and there shouldn't be any mistake about it, is a reality where Trump as president is the crowning symptom of a great cancer in our society, and it's the cancer of disconnection. It will kill us if we don't start treating it aggressively. The second and most, most important thing Tim does throughout this book really, really well is to introduce a vocabulary of institutions, and he does so right from the very beginning. He opens with a poignant scene in the pediatric ICU with his daughter, who just endured a scary loss of oxygen, sound like, sort of stop breathing, while, um, while their gradual unfurling of friend, friends came to support him and his wife, and he alluded to this, um, but I'm just gonna actually read the quote because I think it's powerful. Um, in the moment, waking up at 4 a.m. with a sore neck in the tiny curtain booth of the PICU, is that how you say it? Okay. I had an image of a swarm of friends, family, and neighbors rallying to our aid. But as I considered it more during our stay, I saw in greater detail the contours of the support we were enjoying. As I thought about each person or couple who helped us or wrote or called, I noticed there weren't simple bilateral relationships. In almost every case, there was an institution that linked us. Again, this wasn't how we thought about our friends generally. They were just our friends. But whenever I described to others the help we got, I found myself speaking of the couple from our parish or the family from our pool. Some help came from parents at the same boys' school where our oldest sons go. Others are my college roommates. Others are my work colleagues. We mentioned all this earlier. Our dense and broad network of friends, which had become a short-term safety net, wasn't merely a network of friends. It was a network of organizations, companies, churches, schools, and clubs. The hubs that bound us to these friends are what we call institutions of civil society. Sociologists might say that during those five days, we were drawing on our deep res reserves of social capital. This is really important. There is a lot there are a lot of pro-community voices right now, but they tend to leave out this institutional bit, in part because in many quarters, certainly amongst young people, institutions have become a bit of a four-letter word associated with bureaucracy, stuckness, hierarchy, hypocrisy, oppression. We want to be more fluid, more grassrootsy, more networked, and thus free to be choosy, a little less covenantal. But Tim rightly says it wasn't merely a network of friends. It was a network of organizations, companies, churches, schools, and clubs. He's describing an ecosystem of norm-establishing, norm-sharing hubs, hubs that you belong to, that give you membership and a role, that train you in how to behave, 
that are there for you in a crisis and there alongside you at a picnic, that have built in mentors and stories and songs that allow you to take things for granted because you've come to trust them, and that have just embodied wisdom in them. That's what institutions have. And he's saying that there are too many Americans for whom this life-giving, moral-making set of webs has been lost or has never even been experienced. I'm going to quote him again. He says, studies of individuals found Trump supporters doing just fine. Studies of places found Trump doing well where people were doing poorly. In other words, it wasn't that economically struggling individuals tacked to Trump. It was that voters in struggling or vulnerable places tracked, shifted toward Trump. This is crucial. Trump did well among individuals who seemed to be doing OK, except that they lived in places that were very much not OK. Studying people by demographic data on the chart tells you only so much. Studying people in the context of where they are as members of communities is necessary if we want to understand our country. The people who most fervently supported Trump were the neighbors to those who were doing so poorly. The vote that the American dream was dead was a cry of, my community is crumbling. Tim, Tim's getting at something here that pollsters rarely cover, namely like our deep, universally experienced primordial needs for membership, for belonging, and ultimately for a sense of union and communion with others. The third thing that I love that he did throughout the book, um, and that is actually rare in this space, is he emphasizes place. Um, that where you begin dictates where you land a lot of the time. It might seem obvious that we should be measuring social and communal health at the zip code level and even smaller, given that the most normal forms of community most of us experience actually happen on blocks and around tables at the corner store with familiar monuments and rituals. But too often place has gotten lost in the discussion by those who have the luxury, maybe, of not needing those immediately proximate to you to help you get by in life. Tim's emphasis has important implications for the budding localism movement around the country and for reshaping how we re measure civic and social health. So just three things I missed in the book quickly, and I'm actually gonna say them directly to you because I don't like, I don't want to criticize you as if you're not here. Um, I thought it was a bit of a bummer that the book is so exclusively a white narrative, particularly given the renewed racial reckoning the country is having. And I know you can't write a book about everything, and I know this is a book exploring and explaining the pain that led to Trump's rise and where that pain resides. But I couldn't help but long for a more complete picture of who else feels the pain. It's not just working class whites who feel the American dream is dead. There are other groups who've long felt this hopelessness, and if anything, their fortunes are getting worse. Um, I think you do dismiss today's African American reality a little too quickly at points. And again, I understand that this was a book about Trump's most passionate base, but given how racially loaded his presidency has become, I, might, I would have appreciated a wider aperture on whose American dream is dead and whether there are overlapping forces in that death, but also overlapping forces, reasons for hope. Um, number two, and you, and you did mention this in your, your remarks and you allude to it throughout the book, but um, just I would love to talk to you more. Technology does seem like a huge factor in the story you're seeking to tell, both in the passion stoking around Trump early on and more fatally in the social and spiritual isolation you're describing. I was just surprised you didn't talk about this more and would love to hear your take on what impact it's had in the communities you've covered. Most of all, um, the thing that had me nodding vigorously and the thing that wrinkled my eyebrows was your exhortation that we just need to revive the church. You have a, pro have a, pro you have a provocative line at the end of your first chapter where you're holding up Oostburg as the ideal village. I think I'm like 30% Dutch, so I should know how to pronounce that. But um, you say, there could conceivably be more Oostbergs. The raw material is more renewable there, and arguably it used to be more plentiful and could be again. It's a sense of duty to one's neighbors, a duty that includes a sense of duty to one's family. It's a sense of both being looked after and being needed. It's a sense of common, higher purpose. It's shared, resilient, mediating institutions. And frankly, in America at least, that common purpose is a common faith, and those mediating institutions are really the church. So that last line of your first chapter had me writing furious arguments in the margins, and they were arguments actually less with you than they were with myself, because <laughs> I was really agreeing with you, and then I was like, uh, but this sounds a little bit like a um, Catholic theocratic argument to me or something, even if that's not how you meant it. 
You write so lucidly about social capital, and then suddenly the church is a solution for all of it, not really building the case that what the church at its best provides, namely moral and spiritual formation, is really where both the church and so many of our other important institutions are in trouble. I'm just not sure the country is at a place culturally where it can start with church. The church has too much baggage. It's not, frankly, always doing a great job of speaking to our contemporary lives. And a lot of us are so distrusting of any moral authority beyond ourselves now that I just don't think you can rely on a model of if you rebuild the church, they will come um, as the first stop on a social renewal plan. I just wondered if you could maybe be a little more subtle and in some ways, more in tune with the historical fact that this country has been bound less by doctrine or bound less by one doctrine and more by a creed of human dignity inspired by the truths of that doctrine, I would argue. And this shared moral creed is both the heresy of America and its genius, its ongoing sort of lived hypocrisy and its eternal aspiration that hopefully we're getting better achieving. And it's a creed that points to care for the other, even love, and carries with it a hidden logic that a wide variety of institutions, not just churches, could embody and transfer in fresh ways in our time. So this just leaves me with my own little offering. Um, I've had the pleasure these last few years of exploring where great formation is happening today, moral formation, civic formation, sometimes spiritual formation. I've gone everywhere from prisons, to big universities, to community colleges, to charter schools, to neighborhood revitalization efforts, to artistic communities, to adult learning communities, to sports, to Boy Scouts, to the YMCA, to rehab programs for former criminals, 12 steps programs, to something as simple as an unlikely family of people from radically different backgrounds gathering for a weekly dinner on Thursdays. And what I've noticed is that in this web of institutions, the ones that are truly shaping people um, to be whole and in right relationship with others and with society, the ones that are compelling people's love, trust, and commitment to attach themselves across demographics, across geography, and across sectors, I've noticed that the healthiest and most beloved institutions have a set of traits in common, a way of being, a way of conceiving of themselves and orienting themselves that form a pattern. I've tried to capture this pattern in a slim little volume that's coming out in a few weeks, as um, Sheree mentioned, called The Fabric of Character. And it's a book that tries to narrate the texture of those exemplary institutions operating today, often at a hyper-local level, that taken together impart a logic that more of our institutions across civil society would do well to absorb. I'm going to share this logic very briefly with you now, both as a way of shamelessly advertising my own little book, although his is more important, but more importantly, just to deepen the conversation with Tim and widen our collective imagination on which institutions need leavening for the people Tim highlights in the book, but also for many others, ourselves included. Because desperate as I am for the church to, be, to do what the church was founded to do and be, in my life and in the life of a society I'm concerned about, the fragrance of the church doesn't only need to be confined to hallowed halls. In fact, what I've discovered is that in our time, in this democracy, there's a whole bevy of organizations, large and small, institutions, old and new, influencers, famous and not at all famous, that share a common language of personalism and, and relationality, hospitality and recognition of the human soul. You might call it the language of a shared creed, you might actually see in it a strong wink of religion. And yet it's bubbling up not just from the healthiest religious institutions, but from a wide array of civil society institutions, the thick, the thick ones. So here is the logic in the form of 16 questions. I actually printed out like a two-sided page that I think you can find out there with them. Um, and the book that I've written offers these questions specifically to the philanthropic community, keen on building stronger formative pathways wherever there's a need. But I found that they're also generative for anyone who's attached to a community or organization they care about, that they think changes the lives of people and re the society around them. So I'm just going to read them aloud to you. There are 16 of them, and I'd just ask you to bring to mind right now an institution, organization, or community that you either have influence over or are a beneficiary of that you just really care about and see how it does according to this ideal, as I've observed it in the thickest, most formative institutions that are like leavening relationships and getting us more wholly connected to each other. Okay, 
Number one, two loss. Does the organization have a clear, strong reason for being in the world, embraced and pursued by all of its members? Does it give its members organizing criteria for what to love? Number two, liturgies and rituals. Is there a covenant or creed that is affirmed regularly as a community in word and deed? Are there communal rhythms, routines, and rituals? Number three, full engagement by all members. Are all members of the community or organization, regardless of position or stature, engaged in the mission and aware of the significance and contribution of their roles? Four, power of the particular. Does the organization have a particular identity, a thick set of norms that gets passed on to its members? This is like Lisper, your Dutch reform town example. Does it have a unique quality that is recognizable in those it has shaped? Number five, whole person. Does the place or organization have a clear conception of the whole person, head, heart, and helping hand, and seek to develop it? Six, healthy relationships. Does the institution put relational health as the foundation for its success? Does the organization foster social trust? Does it have a strong sense of community? Seven, tech-wise. Is the institution careful about the latest technological advance, embracing it insofar as it promotes healthy relationships and individual skill, and setting limits when it makes those objectives more difficult? Eight, intentional pluralism. Does it foster opportunities to relate to those unlike yourself? Are members consistently exposed to other worlds, trained in the arts of civility, deep listening, cross-cultural agility? Struggle and growth, number nine. Are there opportunities for growth and tests of character? Does the organization have a process by which such struggles are given meaning and direction? 10, vulnerability and accountability. Has psychological safety been established such that individuals feel free to be honest? Is there a structure of mutual accountability? Reflection, are there built-in processes for reflection and excavation of one's inner life and public fruits? Exemplars, are there attentive and conscientious authority figures like the coach who the building was named after, who serve as role models, coaches, and mentors, does the leader set the character standard for the organization? 13, agency and initiative. Are all members of the organization empowered to act, create, and initiate? Are they encouraged to be responsible moral agents, not simply passive consumers? 14, joy. Is there joy in the house? Are hospitality and unconditional welcome a key part of the institution's DNA? 15, transformation. Are there consistent testimonies of whole person change in a positive direction? And the last one, generativity. When people depart from the formative institution, do they promote a similar culture in other contexts? Has the institution imparted a set of ideals that members want to live up to ever after? So that's a different kind of roadmap, I hope, um, that might help strengthen institutions in a variety of places in our country. So. That's it. Well, thank you so much for that, Tim and Anne. That was fascinating. I know there are a lot of questions from the audience, so we'll just do a very quick uh, uh, gr group of exchange questions here and then turn it over to audience questions. And one obvious one that came to mind, um, Tim, you talked most in your, uh, your remarks today about Oostburg. In your book, you also talk about the different Mormon communities and their bonds of civic trust. And one of the obvious things that comes to mind is uh, both of these examples are fairly homogeneous yep. um, communities, not only, uh, not only uh, religiously, uh, but also racially and in terms of background. Uh, what, how do you promote these kinds of civic bonds uh, in, a, in more diverse communities, particularly as America gets increasingly diverse. And yeah. Anne would love for you to jump in on that as well. And I, I think that ties in with Anne's question, uh, with Anne's uh, criticism earlier, and it, it points out a real problem. After writing Bowling Alone, Robert Putnam looked into diversity in neighborhoods and found that it uh, was inversely correlated with community cohesion. And one way I look at it, though, is Diversity along multiple dimensions is often the problem. I tell a story in, in the book about my next door neighbor, who's uh, Mr. Patel, 
and you know, the normal way I get to know a guy is I invite him over, have a beer on the back deck. Mr. Patel doesn't drink alcohol, he's a Hare Krishna. So I invite him over for a cup of coffee, no. Tea, no. Herbal tea, no. So finally I went up to him and I said, I, this is very awkward, but the way I socialize, get to know a person, is by consuming a liquid together with them. <laughs> Which liquids do you actually consume? I've got some lime LaCroix. You don't put water into cans and bottles. That's destroying God's create. He refused to have the lime LaCroix. I said, what, what is it? He said, put some limes and, and lemons in a big vat of water and you'll do it. This was, and we, we had a great night drinking gently citrified water on the back deck. <laughs> But it was a huge obstacle that we had different norms, different moral views. So diversity, my own parish, St. Andrew, incredibly diverse. There was a Hispanic parish that shut down next door, a black parish, a school shut down. And so the most active parents of both of those parishes showed up. So we're diverse along socioeconomic and racial lines, but it's all people who were really dedicated to Catholic education of their children. And the reason this ends up happening is because I think part of a strong institution is going to be a joint higher purpose. And so you're going to have some level of homogeneity. Ideally, it's providing also the heterogeneity, the diversity. Like, again, my kids know more countries in Africa from our parish than I definitely knew as, as a fourth grader that Malawi and Mozambique are two different countries. You wouldn't know if, if you went to a lot of Montgomery County public schools, to be honest, but at our parish it is. So the way that I would look at it is say, what institutions can we build? There has to be a common joint core to it, but it should have diversity that doesn't diminish the central purpose, but in fact can can add to it, so that, that's the challenge. In our parish, it was an accident, of the two other ones shutting down. How to build that deliberately, you might have a better idea. I would just agree and say that um, diversity, there's a tension, I've thought a lot about this in my work, because originally, with this project, I was asked to go out and find these like beloved communities that are really forming people, and my little spin on it was, I'm really looking for really diverse institutions that are nonetheless oriented towards the transcendent ideals, and that transcendent could be of God or like a little more lowercase t. Um, and I think diversity is a good when contained within an institution that, to what you just said, has like an ultimate purpose that is shared. Um, but it is not a good, and this is not a popular thing to say in sophisticated circles, but it's, it's turned out it's not a good just on the anonymous street. Um, mm. um, and we could get into a, you know, a deeper sort of reflection on really diverse neighborhoods and how they're working well and how they've made that work, but usually there's some subtle institutionalizing going on. Um, and I mean, just this is a bit of a personal example, but about a year and a half ago, I, um, my husband and I are part of this Thursday night dinner, which I referenced, and um, it's a it's a motley crew of of a lot of people from all different backgrounds, 19 to 25 year old kids, um, and then a bunch of adults, and we get together every week for a meal and go around and say what we're thankful for and the highlights of the week. And you get into all sorts of conversations, um, and the kids, and they're not really kids, they're young adults, come from pretty broken homes. And um, and I met a woman at one of the dinners and got into this deep conversation. She uh, lost her husband years ago, and there had been some drug stuff amongst her sons. And we got into this like deep conversation about the nature of family and the inherent complexities of family. And it was like unusually satisfying and uplifting. And the next, very next morning, um, I walked to the metro, and there's this like group of um, homeless guys right near where I get on. And there was a woman who was about the same age, uh, although I wasn't thinking that at the time, who came, who came up to me in a more sort of berating way, um, asking for money, but also sort of accosting me with a variety of um, sentences that I just was like early in the morning, I was stressed about a meeting, and I just like literally walked as far away as I could to not engage her and get on the metro a different way. And I got on the train, and about five seconds into it, I just, there was something nagging at me, and it hit me. I was like, that woman was the exact, probably same profile as the woman I had that really wonderful conversation with last night. But anonymity in this street corner context bred a sense of distrust and no thank you. And I was just struck by how, like, this community that has been formed over time is not anonymous at all because there's a set of norms we've all come to trust. So that's just an example of. 
So Tim, you've argued that the unchurching of America is at the root of our economic and social problems. But you added um, a paragraph in your book that complicates your own argument that I'd love to have you tease out and address a bit. You reported that by many measures, the moderately religious are worse off than mm -hmm. either the very religious or the completely unchurched and unreligious. What is going on where a little bit of religion is more harmful than a lot or none? I, that, I mean, I'd like a, a theologian or someone a lot, <laughs> a lot smarter than me to answer this, but from the, the basic data and look at it as a political reporter, one very close phenomenon to that is that the, again, I said the early Trump support was people who said the American dream is dead. The profile of that was evangelicals, white evangelicals who do not go to church. So the go to church, the easy reaction from a lot of my Christian conservative friends who early on were antagonistic to Trump was, oh, these are a bunch of hypocrites. They just like to talk about religion, but they don't believe it. I don't think that's the most interesting thing. I think it's a lack of belonging. So the, the moderately religious might be, and this, the, the data I found on that, you can't fully prove this, but I think there's a good chance that it's people who uh, ascribe to religious beliefs and value it, but don't belong to a religious community. And the belonging, the attending, all of that is, is a key determinant of a lot of these positive outcomes is what a lot of the social science ends up showing. And the, the, there's lots that we could go on with. We could talk about the geography of some of this and, and the different, you know, again, there's theological questions. But for a lot of people in America, religion is becoming sort of a political view. And so this is a guess because the, there's data that tells similar stories, but it's not, we can't, we don't know for sure, but that the moderately religious might largely be people for whom it's sort of a, a bland identity that's not rooted in a real institution and a real community. And the heavily religious are more likely to be enmeshed in those communities. And then um, you just have uh, more people in, in, the, in the less religious circle who seek their communities outside of religion. So that would be my guess as to that explanation. And as someone with an expertise in morally formative institutions, would love your ideas on why that might be so. It was such a fascinating part of your mm -hmm. book and explained so much about evangelicals and Trump to me, so thank you for that. Um, the, fear, the fierce support for Trump in the early primaries. Um, this is just occurring to me now, so maybe just a theory off the side of my hip, but um, there's something about, uh, like when you really when you're when you're attending and participating in like an evangelical church or any institution over time, it's kind of like a family. Like you rub into things you disagree with. It, 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 there's friction, and that sort of gem tumbler process yields. Um, it, it's no longer as much like part of. It's part of. It's deeply part of your identity, but it's part of a set of identities of behavior, of like moral conscience, of like just your your formation. It's not. Uh, whereas I think somehow, sometimes when you attach yourself to a label, like there was one thing in your book about how evangel the evangelicals who went more spiritually to Trump never, never attended church, but they're the ones most likely to say, I really value religious values yep. or something. That's kind of like an unquestioned, it just becomes, yeah. it's just an identity. So it's, it's like a public identity that's not actually privately internalized. Well, so much more to ask, but we're already over time, so we're going to move to what's always our most dynamic part of the evening, which is hearing from you in the audience. Uh, so if you have questions for either of our speakers, those of you who have been to evening conversations before know that we offer three guidelines for questions. One, we ask that all questions be brief, all questions be civil, and that all questions be in the form of a question. And I see Logan and Matthew are ready to go with microphones. So yes, uh, right there. If you could stand so it's easier for him to see you, that'd be great. Thank you again for the question. And good to meet you. We've never seen, we've seen greeted before. Um, my question is that so much of this assessment is from a broad political assessment of institutions. And I want to sort of take it much more granular to the people vote with their feet concept and go, inside every one of those psychological minds as you map your way toward a solution, 
there's, there's incentives, there's belief systems, there's imprinting, there's all these sort of things in the individual participant going to church, staying attached, or the opposite. How do you sort of flesh those two things out? And either or both can answer the question as a pathway forward, not just, hey, make the institution stronger, give them better stained glass. Yeah. I've got a guy that, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go to the beer, the club rather than to the yeah. church that's making a choice, and why? Well, clubs and local bars are also good guys in my book. I don't wanna vilify <laughs> them. It used to be 90% of all alcohol, of all beer was drunk in public, and it's down to like 30% now, so. Um, <laughs> but we, we Irish Catholics, yeah, separating the beer and the, and the church is not a good idea. But one, one of the things that I, I talk about is um, how, when I talk about the government crowding out private charity, I think that that leads into people going to church less. And I can't prove that, but I think it's part of, because people go join institutions often for a, a very particular purpose, and then what they gain from it is something a lot more. So s specifically, church is the, if the place through which you can serve other people. Again, you walk in, and if you're there just a few times, somebody catches your eye and ropes you in and says, you're gonna be the one to hand out the, the bags, you're gonna be the one to lead people to, um, to the soup kitchen, you're gonna be the one to, to coach this team. Um, and so that often was one way. But I think people need to be brought in for a specific purpose. If you say, the purpose of this institution is to build community connect us together, and give us a higher sense of purpose and provide a safety net, that's not gonna get them in the door. There's gotta be some very particular thing that you're offering them. And just a local coffee shop that serves as a great institution, they offer you coffee and eggs, right? But then they, they pay off in the long run with camaraderie and that sort of thing. So what I think, um, and uh, what, what I didn't do when I was speaking earlier was offer a critique of the church. I'll criticize my church the Catholic Church, it doesn't do enough to say, we are here to very uh, physically, corporally do these works of mercy that we're supposed to do. If you, if you go out and you be, make yourself a real institution out there in the public society, in, in, the, in the public square, I think that that does more of drawing people in. Then the other benefits will flow. So you have to offer somebody something real, whether it's here's your opportunity to serve, here's your food, Here's just a place to, to meet a couple friends. That's always gonna be the first step. You gotta get them in the door with something that's good, but also more tangible, with the idea that the other good things, that might be greater goods, but less visible, will, will, be the, will trickle in later. Nothing to add. Okay. My question's right there. I was wondering, <coughs> as you looked at the church, um, did you look at the adherence to the word of God is a real authoritative document that really is the governing principle of the local church or individuals as a whole. So let me just put it this way. The, the Mormons are the best at keeping their kids in the church and having their churches be these really powerful institutions of civil society. The Dutch reform, I almost called them mini Mormons in the book, but I decided that that might get me into trouble. Or, or, um, the the mainline, uh, mainline Protestants outside of the Dutch reforms had uh, the greatest drop off. And if you look within, um, within Catholicism, the, the congregations that are, are thriving are the ones that are going to be more orthodox. And so that, uh, that's related to that first question, that people aren't looking for something sort of uh, mealy mouth. So I'm not enough of a theologian to answer that in detail, but those data points speak to that. Okay. Uh, right there in the center. If you could stand up so it's easier to see you, that'd be great. Okay, uh, hey. Tim, uh, could you have written this book like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 300 years ago in America? What would have it looked like then in those time periods, and how does it kind of hold up in different historical contexts? Um, so 50 years ago, I would say probably not. Um, I mean, I could say this is all about to end. Look at these dirty hippies down at Woodstock. They're, they're going to destroy this. But the, the 1960s up in was, uh, you know, Charles Murray used 1962 as sort of the, the 
peak of civil society, and a lot of the Robert Putnam data shows that the inequality between connection to civil society among the classes was had basically vanished at that point. But one of the books I cite and where I get my definition of alienation comes from Robert Nisbet's The Quest for Community, which was written in, what, the 40s? And so there is something there. And so this is one of the things I think all conservatives have to think, or anybody assessing our current situation has to think about is there was something of an aberration in the 15, 18 years after the war where we had more of this equality among white people, um, but that there was more, there was less racial, there was less class divide among this. There was stronger civil society. Um, and that was an aberration. And maybe it was an aberration that was based on the back of these other um, abominations of racial discrimination mo most prominently. But that, uh, so yeah, as, as a conservative, I always try to make sure that I'm not glorifying some past period. But the truth is, in a lot of ways, in 1955 to 1962, there was a lot more solidarity. Um, I don't know about writing it a um, 100 years ago, but we, when you talk about that cycle, another thing, my, my response to one of, one of Anne's criticisms is, America has had lots of great awakenings and religious awakenings. And so we have had that. So there have been ups and downs. So I don't think it's pie in the sky for me to hope that it could happen again. Ann, anything to add? No, I'm, I'm still arguing with myself about, I'm totally with you. I, I could tell a long example, but when I think about this country's problems, I always land at, we just need like a big spiritual awakening. So that is actually where I sit. I just think when I heard that all of the mediating institutions in this country are the church, and I, in a lot of my work, I've been very, um, I've been so disarmed by and moved by um, institutions that quietly actually come from some theological roots. Um, even if that's not what's said on their website or whatever. So I, I have wondered, like, there's a big, there's a, there's something going on out there that is, like, deeply religious in nature. It just may not look like the, the church on the cover here. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh expressions, I guess I would put it. Yeah. We're going to take one last question. Hi there. Um, uh, sort of following up on um, these sort of dual perspectives of the solution being um, sort of rebuilding the church um, as the solution to um, societal fragmentation and alienation uh, versus finding that sort of uh, reunification outside of the church in a more uh, perhaps secular context given uh, the trend of secularization in America. I just wonder if even among uh, nominal uh, Judeo-Christian Americans. Um, I guess the first question is, um, if that 70% of our population, um, uh, I guess the first question, does that 70% of our population still espouse um, a value for loving one's neighbor um, or in a more Judeo sort of expression of that loving the stranger? And if so, sort of how can we leverage that common uh, ethos to um, re-enliven a sense of connectedness uh, and remedy um, the alienation that uh, the two of you have both observed. I, I'm really glad that you said, you know, love your neighbor. The, um, the Old Testament verse I have r about five different times in the book is look first after the city to which you have been sent. There's something very specific about loving your neighbor, which is very different than most of national politics. And Chesterton used to talk about this. The breadth of your love is inversely proportional to the depth of it. And so when, when Jesus says, love your neighbor, the, he's asked, who is my neighbor? And the very interesting thing is that it's not the guy who lives next door to you. It's the guy who's there bleeding on the sidewalk. It's a good Samaritan story. It's the guy who's there bleeding on the sidewalk when you're there. So this is the diversity and the difference story but it's also a physical proximity story. And that, I think, is the, the corrective that our, our, our politics needs, is if you start with a love, and again, a love, not just help, not just feed, not just cut a paycheck to, but love your neighbor. And you're gonna feed them if you love them. You're gonna, um, you know, the Good Samaritan takes care of them and then leaves money behind for them. That, that is, I do think there's, uh, that there's a, 
tons of people who, for secular purposes, are, are motivated by that. But I think it can be too easy to abstract mm -hmm. if you don't start with sort of a, what I think is ultimately a theological belief that this other person yeah. is yeah. yeah is in the image of God, has a spark of the divine in them. And I don't care just about the numbers. I care about this person. Right. So I think, I think it can exist in the secular world, but I think religion and a belief in the divine and a spark of the divine in every individual is, 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 might be necessary for really to take hold. And the last word, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Tim's book is going to be available for sale right outside for $28. We invite you to avail yourself of that opportunity. He will be around to sign any copies that are purchased. And in addition to that, I'd like to introduce my very able colleague, Colleen O'Malley Horrocks, to talk to you about another invitation. A timely topic, two insightful speakers, an expertly moderated discussion with an enthusiastic audience uh, who braved literally centimeters of snow. <laughs> Uh, and DC uh, bumper car traffic, really, driving conditions to join us here tonight, as well as hundreds more, potentially, who are, are watching us via live stream. From the safety and security of your warm, dry, slushless homes, <laughs> this is what you can expect from the Trinity Forum. Hi, I'm Colleen Horrocks, and I'm the development director of the Trinity Forum, and we're so grateful to have you with us here tonight. I'm here to extend yet another invitation to the Trinity Forum Society. Along with our generous sponsors, thank you so much, Pete, and Pepperdine School of Public Policy, events like these are only possible due to the generosity and participation of our beloved Trinity Forum Society members. Uh, for those who are not members yet, we would love to have you join us. So if you could take a look at the brochure you found on your chair when you first walked in. As a member, friend, patron, sponsor, or benefactor of the Trinity Forum Society, you'll receive not only discounted registration to events like the ones you have uh, experienced tonight, but you'll also receive our quarterly readings filled with timeless truths from authors of the past, made all the more timely by introductions by leading authors of today and made all the more engaging by thoughtful discussion questions which tie everything together at the end. Cherie likes to call them a book club in a bag. But that's not all. You'll also receive our daily curated email of what we're reading, which includes current articles and opinions from leading thinkers of our day, such as Tim Carney and Ann Snyder, who <laughs> were both featured in the past couple of weeks, and uh, as well as a quarterly podcast with interviews from some of our past and future speakers of the sen and senior fellows. If you're here with us, we'd love to talk to you more. I'll be right down here if you want to say hi. But you can also fill out the brochure and leave it at the book table out there. Or especially for those of you online, we've been working diligently to make it even easier for you to join via our new and improved lovely, lovely website. So all you have to do is go to www.ttf.org from your phone or computer, click on Get Involved from our main menu, and then of course click Join the Trinity Forum Society. As extra incentive, the first 10 people to join this evening will receive a free signed copy of Tim's book, Alienated America, which normally sells for $28. You want to get a good deal. If you're watching via live stream, just send us an email as soon as possible letting us know you joined, and we will happily include you in that top 10 list. We're also continuing to update, categorize, and curate our website to make it all the easier for you to access and engage the best of Christian thought. The video recording of this event should be up in the next day or two, along with all of our past events, so please check it out. And in fact, if you go to our online store within the next 48 hours, reset your clock now, and leave a review of any of the Trinity Forum readings you've read or used in a discussion group, we will send you a free download of that reading to share with someone else, or even a new reading of your choice. So I look forward to speaking with many of you later tonight in just a few minutes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. and. Um, Thank you in advance for joining the Trinity Forum Society. Finally, as we wrap up, it's always appropriate to end with thanks. And as you can imagine, an evening like this does not happen without many people deserving those things. Thanks, first of all, to our very talented partner and friend, Pete Peterson and the Pepperdine School of Public Policy, uh, for their ongoing sponsorship of this series. We're so grateful for it, Pete, and so love working with you. We've had a number of volunteers who braved their way through those uh, storied centimeters of snow to be with us tonight. Elise Amis Draws, Matthew McKnight, intern Emeritus Logos Blandis, and Emily, Emily Hillstrom, thank you so much for your work. 
Thanks, as ever, to our brilliant photographer, Clay Blackmore, for uh, your consistently incredible work. Many thanks to my great colleagues, uh, Colleen Horrocks, Alyssa Abraham Krauboth, uh, and uh, Becca Noyes, who's not here tonight, as well as our excellent new intern, Riley Oliver from Calvin. Finally, thank you to Tim and Ann for a fascinating and insightful discussion. To all of you for coming, and good night.